Section 9 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 9, Lecture 4. Influence of Imagination on Architecture. Part 2. You all probably know the beautiful photographs which have been published within the last year or two of the porches of the Cathedral of Amiens. I hold one of these up to you, merely that you may know what I am talking about, as of course you cannot see the detail at this distance, but you will recognize the subject. Have you ever considered how much sympathy and how much humor are developed in filling this single doorway? Footnote. The tympanum of the south transept door it is to be found generally among all collections of architectural photographs. End of footnote. With these sculptures of the history of St. Honoré, and by the way, considering how often we English are now driving up and down the Rue St. Honoré, we may as well know as much of the saint as the old architect cared to tell us. You know, in all the legends of saints who ever were bishops, the first thing you are told of them is that they didn't want to be bishops. So here is St. Honoré, who doesn't want to be a bishop, sitting sulkily in the corner. He hugs his book with both hands, and won't get up to take his crozier. And here are all the city aldermen of Amiens come to poke him up, and all the monks in the town in a great puzzle what they shall do for a bishop if St. Honoré won't be. And here's one of the monks in the opposite corner, who is quite cool about it, and thinks they'll get on well enough without St. Honoré. You see that in his face perfectly. At last St. Honoré consents to be bishop, and here he sits in a throne, and has his book now grandly on his desk instead of his knees, and he directs one of his village curates how to find relics in a wood. Here is the wood, and here is the village curate, and here are the tombs with the bones of St. Victorien and Gentian in them. After this, St. Honoré performs Grand Mass, and the miracle occurs of the appearance of a hand blessing the wafer, which occurrence afterwards was painted for the arms of the abbey. Then St. Honoré dies, and here is his tomb with his statue on the top, and miracles are being performed at it, a deaf man having his ear touched, and a blind man groping his way up to the tomb with his dog. Then here is a great procession in honour of the relics of St. Honoré, and under his coffin are some cripples being healed, and the coffin itself is put above the bar which separates the cross from the lower subjects, because the tradition is that the figure of the crucifix of the church of St. Firmin bowed its head in token of acceptance as the relics of St. Honoré passed beneath. Now just consider the amount of sympathy with human nature and observance of it shown in this one bas-relief, the sympathy with disputing monks, with puzzled alderman, with melancholy recluse, with triumphant prelate, with palsy-stricken poverty, with ecclesiastical magnificence, or miracle-working faith. Consider how much intellect was needed in the architect, and how much observance of nature before he could give the expression to these various figures, cast these multitudinous draperies, design these rich and quaint fragments of tombs and altars, weave with perfect animation the entangled branches of the forest but you will answer me all this is not architecture at all it is sculpture will you then tell me precisely where the separation exists between one and the other we will begin at the very beginning i will show you a piece of what you will certainly admit to be a piece of pure architecture footnote see appendix three classical architecture end footnote it is drawn on the back of another photograph, another of these marvellous tympana from Notre Dame, which you call, I suppose, impure. Well, look on this picture and on this. Don't laugh. You must not laugh. That's very improper of you. This is classical architecture. I have taken it out of the essay on that subject in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Yet I suppose none of you would think yourselves particularly ingenious architects if you had designed nothing more than this. Nay, I will even let you improve it into any grand proportion you choose, and add to it as many windows as you choose. 
The only thing I insist upon in our specimen of pure architecture is that there shall be no mouldings nor ornaments upon it, and I suspect you don't quite like your architecture so pure as this. We want a few mouldings, you will say, just a few. Those who want mouldings hold up their hands. We are unanimous, I think. Will you, then, design the profiles of these mouldings yourselves, or will you copy them? If you wish to copy them, and to copy them always, of course I leave you at once to your authorities, and your imaginations to their repose. But if you wish to design them yourselves, how do you do it? You draw the profile according to your taste, and you order your mason to cut it. Now, will you tell me the logical difference between drawing the profile of a moulding, and giving that to be cut, and drawing the folds of the drapery of a statue, and giving those to be cut? The last is much more difficult to do than the first, but degrees of difficulty constitute no specific difference, and you will not accept it surely as a definition of the difference between architecture and sculpture, that architecture is doing anything that is easy, and sculpture anything that is difficult. It is true, also, that the carved moulding represents nothing, and the carved drapery represents something. But you will not, I should think, accept as an explanation of the difference between architecture and sculpture, this any more than the other, that sculpture is art which has meaning, and architecture art which has none. Where, then, is your difference? In this, perhaps, you will say, that whatever ornaments we can direct ourselves and get accurately cut to order we consider architectural. The ornaments that we are obliged to leave to the pleasure of the workman, or the superintendence of some other designer, we consider sculptural, especially if they are more or less extraneous and encrusted, not an essential part of the building. Accepting this definition, I am compelled to reply that it is in effect nothing more than an amplification of my first one, that whatever is easy you call architecture, whatever is difficult you call sculpture. For you cannot suppose the arrangement of the place in which the sculpture is to be put is so difficult or so great a part of the design as the sculpture itself. For instance, you all know the pulpit of Niccolo Pisano in the baptistry at Pisa. It is composed of seven rich relievi, surrounded by panel mouldings and sustained on marble shafts. Do you suppose Niccolo Pisano's reputation, such part of it at least as rests on this pulpit, and much does, depends on the panel mouldings or on the relievi? The panel mouldings are by his hand. He would have disdained to leave even them to a common workman. But do you think he found any difficulty in them? or thought there was any credit in them. Having once done the sculpture, those enclosing lines were mere child's play to him. The determination of the diameter of shafts and the weight of capitals was an affair of minutes. His work was in carving the crucifixion and the baptism. Or again, do you recollect Orcagna's tabernacle in the church of San Michele at Florence? That also consists of rich and multitudinous bas-reliefs, enclosed in panel mouldings, with shafts of mosaic, and foliated arches sustaining the canopy. Do you think Orcagna, any more than Pisano, if his spirit could rise in the midst of us at this moment, would tell us that he had trusted his fame to the foliation, or had put his soul's pride into the panelling? Not so. He would tell you that his spirit was in the stooping figures that stand round the couch of the dying virgin. Or lastly, do you think the man who designed the procession on the portal of Amiens was the subordinate workman? That there was an architect over him, restraining him within certain limits, and ordering of him his bishops at so much a mitre, and his cripples at so much a crutch? Not so. Here, on this sculptured shield, rests the master's hand. This is the centre of the master's thought. From this, and in subordination to this, waved the arch and sprang the pinnacle. Having done this, and being able to give human expression and action to the stone, all the rest, the rib, the niche, the foil, the shaft, were mere toys to his hand and accessories to his conception. And if once you also gain the gift of doing this, if once you can carve one fronton such as you have here, I tell you, 
you would be able, so far as it depended on your invention, to scatter cathedrals over England as fast as clouds rise from its streams after summer rain. Nay, but perhaps you answer again, our sculptors at present do not design cathedrals, and could not. No, they could not, but that is merely because we have made architecture so dull that they cannot take any interest in it and therefore do not care to add to their higher knowledge the poor and common knowledge of principles of building. You have thus separated building from sculpture, and you have taken away the power of both. For the sculptor loses nearly as much by never having room for the development of a continuous work, as you do from having reduced your work to a continuity of mechanism. You are, essentially, and should always be, the same body of men, admitting only such difference in operation as there is between the work of a painter at different times, who sometimes labours on a small picture, and sometimes on the frescoes of a palace gallery. The conclusion, then, we arrive at, must arrive at, the fact being irrevocably so, that in order to give your imagination and the other powers of your souls full play, you must do as all the great architects of old time did, you must yourselves be your sculptors. Phidias, Michelangelo, Orcagna, Pisano, Giotto, which of these men do you think could not use his chisel? You say, it is difficult, quite out of your way. I know it is. Nothing that is great is easy, and nothing that is great, so long as you study building without sculpture, can be in your way. I want to put it in your way, and you to find your way to it. But on the other hand, do not shrink from the task as if the refined art of perfect sculpture were always required from you. For though architecture and sculpture are not separate arts, there is an architectural manner of sculpture, and it is, in the majority of its applications, a comparatively easy one. Our great mistake at present in dealing with stone at all is requiring to have all our work too refined. It is just the same mistake as if we were to require all our book illustrations to be as fine work as Raphael's. John Leach does not sketch so well as Leonardo da Vinci, but do you think that the public could easily spare him, or that he is wrong in bringing out his talent in the way in which it is most effective? Would you advise him, if he asked your advice, to give up his wood blocks and take to canvas? I know you would not. Neither would you tell him, I believe, on the other hand, that because he could not draw as well as Leonardo, therefore he ought to draw nothing but straight lines with a ruler, and circles with compasses, and no figure subjects at all. That would be some loss to you, would it not? You would all be vexed if next week's punch had nothing in it but proportionate lines. And yet do not you see that you are doing precisely the same thing with your powers of sculptural design that he would be doing with his powers of pictorial design, if he gave you nothing but such lines. You feel that you cannot carve like Phidias, therefore you will not carve at all, but only draw mouldings, and thus all that intermediate power which is of a special value in modern days, that popular power of expression which is within the attainment of thousands, and would address itself to tens of thousands, is utterly lost to us in stone, though in ink and paper it has become one of the most desired luxuries of modern civilization. Here, then, is one part of the subject to which I would especially invite your attention, namely, the distinctive character which may be wisely permitted to belong to architectural sculpture, as distinguished from perfect sculpture on one side, and from mere geometrical decoration on the other. At first observe what an indulgence we have in the distance at which most work is to be seen. Supposing we were able to carve eyes and lips with the most exquisite precision, it would all be of no use as soon as the work was put far above the eye. But on the other hand, as beauties disappear by being far withdrawn, so will faults. And the mystery and confusion which are the natural consequence of distance, while they would often render your best skill but vain, will as often render your worst errors of little consequence. Nay, more than this, often a deep cut or a rude angle will produce in certain positions an effect of expression both startling and true, which you never hoped for. Not that mere distance will give animation to the work, if it has none in itself, 
but if it has life at all, the distance will make that life more perceptible and powerful by softening the defects of execution. So that you are placed, as workmen, in this position of singular advantage, that you may give your fancies free play, and strike hard for the expression that you want, knowing that if you miss it, no one will detect you. If you at all touch it, nature herself will help you, and with every changing shadow and basking sunbeam bring forth new phases of your fancy. But it is not merely this privilege of being imperfect which belongs to architectural sculpture. It has a true privilege of imagination, far excelling all that can be granted to the more finished work, which for the sake of distinction I will call, and I don't think we can have a much better term, furniture sculpture. Sculpture, that is, which can be moved from place to furnish rooms. For observe, to that sculpture the spectator is usually brought in a tranquil or prosaic state of mind. He sees it associated rather with what is sumptuous than sublime, and under circumstances which address themselves more to his comfort than his curiosity. The statue, which is to be pathetic, seen between the flashes of footman's livery round the dining-table, must have strong elements of pathos in itself, and the statue, which is to be awful, in the midst of the gossip of the drawing-room, must have the elements of awe wholly in itself. But the spectator is brought to your work already in an excited and imaginative mood, he has been impressed by the cathedral wall as it loomed over the low streets before he looks up to the carving of its porch and his love of mystery has been touched by the silence and the shadows of the cloister before he can set himself to decipher the bosses on its vaulting so that when once he begins to observe your doings he will ask nothing better from you nothing kinder from you than that you would meet this imaginative temper of his half-way that you would farther touch the sense of terror, or satisfy the expectation of things strange, which have been prompted by the mystery or the majesty of the surrounding scene. And thus, your leaving forms more or less undefined, or carrying out your fancies, however extravagant, in grotesqueness of shadow or shape, will be for the most part in accordance with the temper of the observer, and he is likely, therefore, much more willingly to use his fancy to help your meanings than his judgment to detect your faults. Again, remember that when the imagination and feelings are strongly excited, they will not only bear with strange things, but they will look into minute things with a delight quite unknown in hours of tranquillity. You surely must remember moments of your lives in which, under some strong excitement of feeling, all the details of visible objects presented themselves with a strange intensity and insistence, whether you would or no, urging themselves upon the mind and thrust upon the eye with a force of fascination which you could not refuse. Now, to a certain extent, the senses get into this state whenever the imagination is strongly excited. Things trivial at other times assume a dignity or significance which we cannot explain, but which is only the more attractive because inexplicable, and the powers of attention, quickened by the feverish excitement, fasten and feed upon the minutest circumstances of detail and remotest traces of intention, so that what would at other times be felt as more or less mean or extraneous in a work of sculpture, and which would assuredly be offensive to the perfect taste in its moments of languor or of critical judgment, will be grateful and even sublime when it meets this frightened inquisitiveness, this fascinated watchfulness of the roused imagination. And this is all for your advantage, for, in the beginnings of your sculpture, you will assuredly find it easier to imitate minute circumstances of costume or character than to perfect the anatomy of simple forms or the flow of noble masses. And it will be encouraging to remember that the grace you cannot perfect, and the simplicity you cannot achieve, would be in great part vain even if you could achieve them, in their appeal to the hasty curiosity of passionate fancy, but that the sympathy which would be refused to your science will be granted to your innocence, and that the mind of the general observer, though wholly unaffected by the correctness of anatomy or propriety of gesture, will follow you with fond and pleased concurrence, as you carve the knots of the hair and the patterns of the vestiture. 
End of section 9. Recording by Todd Albrick.